Um, the people who are here later, hopefully those early people will get done first and then it'll free up space. Uh, so every person spends as little time as possible on the exams. Exams will be between 60 and 65 questions probably, no more than 65. Uh, maybe as low as 55, it just depends. Um, I'm going to make the exam on Friday evening, thank goodness. Last term I couldn't do that because they had a Friday evening course. And so I'll come in on Friday night and just set it up and everything. So it should be ready to go. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So the, let's see, any, most of you guys were with me last term, but the, the practical should be almost identical to our quizzes. That doesn't mean they're the same questions, but I mean the types of questions. They're either going to be models, and there will be a lot of those. Uh, they might be projections, and they might be conceptual questions. The practicals tend to lead more, lean more towards models. They're actually just like this quiz, I would say. We had twice as many questions on models as we did concepts. That's kind of more like what the practicals are like. About twice as many model questions as conceptual questions. Um, and then a few projection questions thrown in there just so that you can look up here and you don't have to actually have a station. Um, but yeah, so go over, make sure you guys are reviewing this week. Don't forget to review topics that maybe you, a lot of times what happens is like you don't get a topic and then it doesn't show up on the quiz. So you don't get that like force, the reinforcement to go back and study. Make sure you're detailed when you go back and review. Go through each one of the terms um, because it's the, the practical is not, I don't like pick questions that are similar to the ones I just asked. I just randomly select them. So make sure that you are thorough in your review. So today we have a good week. What happened to my projector? Oh no, it's just the software. Great. Um, the endocrine system. So this week we're going to be studying the endocrine system. And this is a good week because as you notice, there's only about two pages worth of information. You guys have already been introduced to the endocrine system, right? You guys talked about hormones, what a tropic hormone is. We're going to review some of that, but there's some overlap between lecture and lab. I want to be clear that there will be no lab questions based on function. So we are really just looking at tissues today. <clears throat> We're going to be knowing where hormones come from specifically, and that's it. We're not going to be covering the functions of any of those hormones. That's all lecture. Yeah? Was this going to be on our practical? This will be on your practical, yeah? Yes. And the practical will be evenly weighted more or less between all four weeks. So this week will not be overrepresented just because you haven't had a quiz on it it'll be even. So I just usually divide them by four and it usually works out pretty well. So you don't have to like overly study for this stuff because I'm going to give you like 20 questions on the practical on this. I won't. It'll be evenly weighted. So not a whole ton of material today. The big challenge today is we're getting back to histology. So you're going to be challenging your perception a little bit. Um, and so we haven't done really any histology yet this term. And so I think it'll be really important that you guys spend a lot of time on the histology today. That's really the secret, if there is one to histology. Just like when we talked about the visual system, you guys all, we all learned to see a two-dimensional cube drawing that is actually an illusion that it's 3D. That's all a learned thing, and you kind of have to do that with histology, too. And it just takes a lot of time. What I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through each one of the tissues, and I'm going to tell you uh, precisely what I want to know from each and every one of the... Uh, the sheet's gone from each and every one of the tissues. Uh, whatever, I'm going to tell you what you need to look for. Let me rephrase that. I lost my train of thought because I don't know where my paper went. I'm going to tell you all the key ways to pick out one tissue from another. Because that's the other thing you need in histology. You cannot try to have photographic memory. It just doesn't work. Things look different. It's like trying to memorize what a person looks like. You just can't do that. You have to know what the common features are in all people to be able to tell maybe a person from a chimpanzee or something like that. And so with histology, you've got to look for what I call distinguishing features. So that's what I'm going to hit on each one of the tissues so that you guys can know what to look for. That way you're not chasing the wrong information whenever you're looking at uh, individual organs. All right, so number one, let's just review the definition of hormones. So these are things, usually proteins, amino acids, they keep on expanding the definition of hormones um, because it turns out there's all sorts of different molecules but the general idea is that they are usually protein based in some way and they are released into the bloodstream to act on the entire body. So that, this system combined with our, our nervous system allow us, which we are pretty big organisms, it allows us to change things in our entire body. So nervous system is pretty much instantaneous in terms of its changes. 
Whereas the endocrine system can be quick, but it's not instantaneous. The quickest our endocrine system works is when you have a severe stress response. And severe, I don't mean trauma, I mean like when someone you like comes up and talks to you and you get all sweaty and your heart rate goes up. This is endocrine organs work. This is the medulla of the adrenal gland dumping epinephrine into your bloodstream and it hits you, but it still takes two or three seconds at the minimum for that to be felt. So that's what we mean by takes a long time. Still not very long. As long as you have good blood flow, these things are gonna circulate relatively quickly throughout your whole body. Now, the other thing I wanna mention about the endocrine system is that you're gonna get different definitions of what organs are part of the endocrine system as you continue to study things. So at the 200 level, you usually have the collection of endocrine organs that we're gonna talk about today and what you're gonna talk about in lecture. Later in the term, when we get to the heart, we're gonna throw in the fact that, oh yeah, the heart's an endocrine organ. And then maybe I'll mention, hopefully I do, though it's not in our curriculum, that the kidney is actually an endocrine organ. And your skin's an endocrine organ. And your brain's an endocrine organ. Your esophagus has endocrine function. Um, let's see, which one's, pancreas obviously that is today. If we move down, they, they think the small intestine does, the stomach does for sure, you're gonna learn about that. So the takeaway message is that this endocrine system thing is kinda outdated. Basically every organ in your body probably has endocrine function. If it's not in the lists in the textbook, it's just because we haven't figured it out yet. And so this is kind of the basic introduction to the fact that all tissues in the body could potentially operate this way. And these are the ones that we know about the most. So we can talk about them for a long time, but do not be surprised that if every, I'd say maybe five years, there's a new endocrine organ out there that now is generally accepted as an endocrine organ. Now, tropic hormone. So I want to know, I want to be clear about what that means. That is a hormone that acts to release another hormone. And so you're going to see a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone. And that's a great name. So don't just memorize it as ACTH because adrenocorticotropic hormone. That is a hormone that acts on the adrenal cortex to release other hormones. So they're great names when it comes to the endocrine system. Um, and that's mostly because it's relatively new that we've discovered these things, and so we've moved away from calling them, at, naming them after people, which is, as you all know, the thing that keeps me up at night. All right, so before we move into just individual pictures, I do want to clarify, I think it's page 17, it's a list that says microscopic structures at the top, and it's a big list of all of our hormones. Oh, I did not mean to close this. And I am going to use that list going to do two things. I want to give you guys all the hormones and exactly what cells they come from. I just want you to get them in your notes right now um, so that there's no confusion over that. And then the second thing is I'm going to have you cross things out, not because you don't need to know them, but because I don't want you to identify them under a microscope. So when I, I just want to be clear, I'm going to say cross this off, but that doesn't mean you don't have to know it. You still need to know it conceptually but you don't need to pick it out under a microscope. So I'm gonna narrow down your microscopic terms, but that is not eliminating them completely. So um, for these specific hormones, I put a picture, I just typed up my notes, I took a picture of it. So this is on the website in case you lose your notes or anything like that. But in parentheses, so you should have a list that looks similar to this, it starts out with thyroid gland. And then in parentheses, I've just added the hormones themselves just so that we have them all. So let's go through them real quick just to make sure we're clear. And I'll mention what their full names are here too. And feel free to jot those down. A lot of times it's better to know the full name than it is the abbreviation because the name itself will tell you something about what the hormone does. And again, I'm not gonna ask you functional questions, but you're gonna get them in lecture. So you might as well do it. All right, so thyroid gland. Have your pencils ready. Thyroid gland, I do want you to Identify that under a microscope, that's an easy one. We'll talk about that in a second. I want you to identify all of these things, so sorry you're not crossing anything off for the thyroid gland. But add those to your notes. T3 and T4 are secreted from what are called follicular cells. We'll go over where those are and what they look like in a second. And then parafollicular cells, that's where calcitonin comes from. So if you remember calcitonin, it's a hormone that decreases blood calcium levels. That's coming from the parafollicular cells. Now, parathyroid gland, for most of you, this parathyroid will be on the exact same microscope slide as the thyroid gland, because they're, as we'll see in a second, they're connected to each other physically. 
They have two cells in them. You can cross off both of those cells. You do not need to identify either of these cells under a microscope. However, I do want you to know that both chief and oxyphil cells are found in the parathyroid glands. So that's what I mean by knowing them conceptually. You still need to know where they are. Yeah. Do you want us to know par what parathyroid gland looks like to cell to us? Yes. So, so the only type of question that you're going to get about the parathyroid gland under a microscope is what is this gland? So you do need to still tell me I'm looking at a parathyroid gland. But don't worry about teasing out these two cells. Just know that the chief cells are very important and that they secrete parathyroid hormone. And so that was the hormone that worked in the opposite way that calcitonin did. So this actually boosts blood calcium level. I'm just mentioning that to tie in last term again. You don't need to know function. So go ahead and cross those off for histology. Pancreas. In the pancreas, I am only concerned that you can pick out pancreatic islets. You can cross beta cells, alpha cells, and pancreatic acid eye off. Islets, the pancreatic islets, also known as the islets of Langerhans. That's a fancy name. I do hate names like this, but it does help people remember them sometimes. It's kind of an exciting name. Um, but I do want you to know that the beta cells and alpha cells are actually in the pancreatic islets. They are part of That's what they're made of. There's, two, there's three types of cells, actually, but the two that we know a lot about are beta and alpha cells. And these are going to come up a lot if you've ever heard of things like beta cell burnout as one of the mechanisms of one type of type 2 diabetes, that's actually the beta cells no longer being able to release insulin into the blood. Therefore, you actually can't bring the blood glucose down, blood glucose level down. Alpha cells are releasing glucagon, it does the opposite, brings the blood glucose levels up. And then pancreatic acini, you don't have to do it under a microscope, I'm just trying to think of a reason that you even need to know that they exist. We're going to get to them in the digestive system. That's their function. They release digestive enzymes. And also, they have an endocrine or an exocrine function into the digestive system. But you can pretty much cross them off. We're going to get there. We're going to focus on this part of the pancreas when we do digestive system next term. So no hormones, no identification. And if I asked you where the pancreatic acini are, I hope you can tell me. It's supposed to be an N, not an R. It's pancreatic. Oh, it does say pancreatic. That's a spelling error. That's a cool name, though. All right, so pituitary gland. Uh, pituitary gland, a lot of hormones coming from this. This is called our master endocrine organ. Um, it was one of the first discovered endocrine organs. It has an anterior lobe. I do want you to be able to pick that out. It has acetophils, basophils, and chromophobes in the anterior lobe. You can cross all three of those out. You don't need to pick those out. But I do want you to know that acetophils, which are inside of the anterior lobe. So what I'm going to talk about now is all going on in the anterior lobe. The acetophils are releasing prolactin. That's what the PRL stands for. And growth hormone. That's the GH. So that's it for the acetophils. Easy enough to remember because there's only two. Basophils. These are a little harder to remember because there's a lot. So B flat is how I remember it. The B is for basophil, and the FLAT stands for follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and thyroid stimulating hormone. So these names are fantastic when it comes to the function, right? All of these give you some idea of what's going on, or what this hormone's actually going to end up doing. So that's all from the basophils and then chromophobes. Just know that they're part of the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Um, the other thing I want you to write next to pituitary gland um, is hypo hypophysis. So uh, you just remember this, actually. I don't need you to know this for an examination. I need you to know this because in your slide, it's hypophysis, cat. It's not pituitary cat. Because another word is hypothesis. That's an older name for the pituitary gland, but it's still used. And you're going to see that. That's what it says in your slide box. Just to, I want to mention it now so we're not all searching for pituitary. Because it's not there. It's hypothesis cat. And surprisingly, not cat hypothesis. All right, and then posterior lobe, that's the, the posterior region of the pituitary gland. It's actually quite different than the other side of the <coughs> pituitary gland. But this is ADH and oxytocin. 
ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. We'll talk about that at length when we get to the kidneys. A diuretic is something that makes you lose water. So antidiuretic hormone prevents you from losing water. So when you're dehydrated, this is a really, really important uh, hormone for keeping your water level and blood pressure high. That's why we're going to talk about it a lot when we get to the kidney. Uh, oxytocin is, in generally, it's more of a psychological bonding hormone. At least that's how we understand what it does. Uh, both of those, and those are the only two that are coming from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And then infundibulum, we saw this with the brain. That's just the connection between the pituitary gland um, and the brain. So cross infundibulum off, cross pituocyte off as well. So for the pituitary gland, really, you're just going to be conceptually knowing quite a bit. Because this is where the most hormones are coming from this week. But in terms of the histology, it's, I'm going to either ask you to name the gland, and that's pituitary gland or name the region or lobe of the gland, and that would either be anterior or posterior lobe. And we'll talk about how to differentiate that in a second. And then the, or the adrenal gland, you can cross off all the zonas. The adrenal gland is really diff difficult histologically because it's not a very neat and tidy organ. It's very mixed up. Um, the only thing I want you to pick out under a microscope is that you're looking at an adrenal gland. That's it. So you can cross off all of them, I suppose. I do want you to know that the organ has a cortex and that the organ has a medulla. And I actually want you to add something to the medulla. Medulla, I want you to know that epinephrine and norepinephrine, you're going to talk about these more in lecture, that's where that is coming from. So that's our principal initial stress hormone. It gets our body to get excited throughout the whole, our entire body. It sends us into sympathetic response. And so both epinephrine and norepinephrine are released from the adrenal medulla specifically. Whereas in the cortex, you have a very different role. The cortex has these three zones, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. The glomerulosa secretes aldosterone. That's another important hormone that you'll get to when you study the kidneys. The fasciculata secretes cortisol. That's another stress hormone. Um, that has more metabolic activities, like it changes the proportion of fats versus carbohydrates that your body uses when you're stressed out. It modifies your immune system. It does a lot of the stuff that long-term is actually really bad for us. Um, and that's why this is, this is taking over the title of the stress hormone. It's stealing it from epinephrine and norepinephrine for good reason. Zona reticularis, those are your androgens, so primarily testosterone in both males and females is released from the adrenal cortex. In females, it's converted into estrogen. Uh, in males, it's not. So that is it for what you guys need to know. So that's, that's the majority of the material for today. Yeah? For thyroid, did mm -hmm. you say identify follicles, T3, T4, and thyroglobulin, or just thyroid? So the thyroid and everything. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk about that Next, okay. thyroid gland's an easy one to pick out. So even though there's a lot of different questions I could ask you, I don't think it's going to be too challenging for you. And so follicular cells, I don't know if I mentioned this, T3 and T4, you'll see it written in a second what this stands for, but it's tetra, is the T4 is tetra iodothyronine. So thyronine is a molecule, big, big amino, big, big molecule, amino acid-based molecule. Iodo is iodine, and the tetra part just means there's four iodines. So it's just the fancy way to describe this specific molecule, but you'll usually hear it as T3 and T4, or people will throw out the term thyroxine, um, or any drug with the name thyroxine in it is used to modify what the thyroid gland does. And the thyroid gland is your main controller of metabolic rate, um, rather than, it's your main, if you're just sitting in a chair, the thing that's going to boost and drop your metabolic rate are T3 and T4 being released. So when people have abnormalities in T3 and T4 release, they tend to have those type of metabolic issues. You're either going to have a depressed metabolism, you're probably going to gain weight and feel kind of bad, or you can have an elevated metabolism that actually causes you to lose weight rapidly, causes you to be much warmer than normal, um, and that's all based on T3 and T4. All right, so let's take a look 
real quick at that thyroid gland, and then we'll go back to the pituitary. So thyroid gland, this is below your larynx. So we'll talk about the larynx during the first week of next term. We'll look at some really cool videos that talk about how you actually produce sound. It's pretty cool. Uh, but right below it, you've got the thyroid gland. So thyroid gland, you can actually feel under 